Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Boucher, and this is on the issues, and today we're releasing the latest edition of the Marquette University Law School poll. Joining me today is Professor Charles Franklin. He's the director of the poll, a uh, well-known figure now because of uh, your polling prowess. <laughs> uh, he's going to go over the uh, results of uh, our latest survey. And uh, as we always do, uh, we're going to begin by talking about the sample, uh, when the poll was done, who we talked to, how many folks were involved in this survey, cell phones, and let's start right there, Charles. Uh, very good. So we were in the field on March 20th to 23rd, so that was last Thursday through Sunday. Um, uh, I think for once there was not some huge breaking news story in the middle of the field. So, I think it was a quiet weekend. March Madness. Small issue of March Madness. Uh, we might underrepresent basketball fans a little bit. Um, we did 801 registered voters in the state. Um, of those, a little over 30% are cell phone and 70% landline. Though when you weight the data, it's about 40% cell phone. Uh, one of the interesting evolutions in cell phones recently is that by the latest numbers, we're now up to 90% of the population with a cell phone. Um, I don't know that there's anybody old enough to match me on this, but I grew up with a party line phone, a <laughs> landline in the 50s. Um, that, that, you know, but if you think about it, Landline penetration in the 50s was about where cell phones are now. So cell phones are just becoming a completely ubiquitous part of life. On the other hand, it's still only in the mid-30s or low 30% range of people who say they only get their calls on the cell phone. The biggest growth group is the mixed group that, frankly, is like me. I, they're just phones. So we've been raising our percentage of cell phones to represent that, I think, looking down the road two, three, four, five years, you can easily imagine a world in which we just called your phone and we no longer make a distinction between landline and cell. But we're not there yet, but, but we're moving that in that direction. Um, so that's the, the basic setup of the sample. With 801 respondents, we have a margin of error of plus or minus three and a half percent. Uh, this has been our standard design all year, and we'll stick with it for the most part uh, through election day of around 800 respondents. And Charles, these are live interviews. This is not a robocall phenomenon. These are, these are right. live interviews. Definitely live interviews, um, uh, you know, which goes with the fact that we do cell phones. Um, robocalls or automated polls are prohibited by FCC regulations from calling cell phones. So the automated polls you see are of landline only, though some, uh, Rasmussen is an example, are now trying to augment their robo-polls with <coughs> phones by also interviewing people online who say they only use a cell phone and try to compensate for that. So there's some developments in the world of public technology, but it's really um, complicated and it's hard for the uh, normal reader of these things to know exactly what their methodology is. I was at least a straight phone. Cell and landline, human interviewer, that's it. We'll look at the findings of this poll in just one moment. Uh, we always get a lot of questions about who did you talk to? In other words, uh, how did people self-identify? Were they Democrats, Republicans, people who lean one way or the other? Uh, we've seen some trends nationally, more and more people uh, uh, calling themselves independents. Uh, what did we find when we did the sample this time around? Uh, there's some interesting stuff going on, so I thought it was worth talking uh, just a minute or two uh, at the risk of delaying getting to the main event. Um, so take a look at what's happening with partisanship. So, these are the national party trends based on all national polls that have been released since 2008 um, that identify what percentage of their sample was Democrat, Independent, and Republican. And what you see that's so striking is after the 2012 election, there was a noticeable dip in Republican identification and just a little bit later, a dip in Democratic identification, coupled with a rise, a fairly sharp rise, in the percentage of people calling themselves independents. 
in the last few months, that were, sorry, Mike, I want to make sure I don't give you that leave me laser surgery. surgery. <laughs> uh, 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 that's okay. Uh, so after this initial dip, Republican identification has remained pretty stable, has picked up less than a full percentage point right there at the end, but come up just a little bit. <clears throat> Democratic identification that started down a little bit later and didn't initially drop as sharply has nevertheless continued to come down um, at, a, at a pretty steady pace for the last uh, six or eight months. And that independent identification is rising at a little slower rate recently, but it's still rising. So those national trends are important to think about, and now I want to show you what's happening in our data here in Wisconsin. Um, our differences are, um, well, in some ways, parallel to these. So in this current sample, when we ask people the first partisanship question, the question is, generally speaking, do you usually think of yourself as a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent? And in the answers to that, this sample we have 25% Republican, 27 Dem, and 44 Independent, a plus two Democratic advantage. That is down from what we have averaged over the previous uh, 2012 cycle, where we were averaging just over 32% Democratic and 27 and a fraction percent Republican. So, what had been running at about a five-point margin has shrunk to about a two-point margin. Okay? It's not quite as simple as that. When people say they're independent, and as you can see, 44% of this sample say, I'm an independent, we then follow that up by asking, would you say you're closer to the Democratic Party or closer to the Republican Party? We call those folks partisan leaners, because they lean to one party or another. And while they don't vote as loyally as full partisans, where party line voting is typically 90% or more, they're still quite partisan in their voting. These are certainly not 50-50 voters. They're more like 80 to 85% party loyalists. So what happens when we do that? What we've got in this sample, here's the 25 to 27 you saw earlier. But look at the leaners, leaning Republicans at 26, leaning Dems at 20, a four-point gap among leaners. I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. I meant 16 to 20, some four-point gap. Thank you. Because <laughs> the mind glitches from time to time. Um, now, that's interesting because throughout 2012 and 13, we have normally seen leaners end up being within a point of each other. In fact, it's very common to see the leaners within tenths of a percentage point of equal to one another. So what seems to be going on here is that some of that decline in democratic identification on the first question is being made up in the leaning question. So the net effect, when we put those two together, so this is partisanship now counting the leaners as partisan, we're back up to an eight point, uh, there's some rounding error here that the previous one would have been a seven point difference <coughs> made. That's all because of just the way the um, numbers round. Is a 40% Republican, 48 Dems. Now, if you look at our data in the recent past, when you look at it in October, we were at 28 Republican, 32 Dem. In January, it was 25, 30. Uh, notice a four-point gap in October, a five-point gap in January, and now in March, a two-point gap, 25, 27. But if you put the leaners in, in October, it was seven-point gap, 42, 49. In January, it was a seven-point gap, 40, 47. And in March, it's an eight-point gap, 40-48. So what you're seeing here seems to be a movement of Democrats being a little less strong in their Democratic identification, not switching parties, not even moving into pure independent status, but becoming just a little less partisan in recent months. And again, you see that in the national data pretty sharply, 
you see it here in the Wisconsin data as well. Um, we'll talk more about this another time, but if you also look at how motivated people are, how excited they are to vote, how certain they are to vote, the strong Democrats and the strong Republicans are pretty close to equal there, but at least right now, leading Democrats are just a few percentage points, not a lot, but a few percentage points less motivated, less excited than leading Republicans. So I think we're seeing national picture here carrying over in power data. Well, we're, then I'll uh, look at the questions that we asked in this, uh, in this poll. Um, we're beginning with the, the governor's race, and I think the last time we got together was in January. Uh, and that was really before any serious advertising had begun in the race. We've seen the Republican Governors Association advertise. We've seen the governor run his first round of ads. We've seen Mary Burke run her first round of ads. So this is all, uh, I guess, post uh, uh, advertising. So let's take a look at the, at the governor's yeah. race, the Burke uh, Walker matchup to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and so it's uh, barely changed. Burke at 41, Walker at 48, a seven point margin. It was a six point margin, 47 41 uh, back in January. Uh, the margin of error for the poll is 3.5%. So that's no statistically meaningful change. Um, and so to put it that in a different perspective, in spite of the uptick in advertising, in spite of the other events that have happened since January, we see very little movement in the preferences here. Uh, it's worth pointing out that there have been two other polls recently, a Rasmussen poll a couple of weeks ago, and the race at 45-45, and uh, a poll that I'm going to forget the name of came out Monday with a four-point Walker lead. So if you're thinking about where are we in, you know, what do we know, um, those are the only calls that are available at this point plus ours. So we had a two-point lead in October for Governor Walker, a six-point in January, and essentially the same seven-point now. And that compares with two automated polls, uh, one that shows the time, one that shows Walker with a four-point lead. Do you have a graph with the, the January numbers on the I'm sorry, thank you. Um, so there was the, uh, the January scorecard, 47-41, um, compared to the 48-41 now. Let's uh, look at the job approval rating for uh, Governor Walker. Yeah. But despite the fact that the race hasn't changed, there's some interesting shifts and starting to shifts and other perceptions that are behind these numbers. So um, the race itself is not really much moved. But there have been a little bit of change. So the governor's job approval now in March is uh, tied, 47-47, with 6.6% uh, um, not having an opinion about his, his job. Um, that's a little bit of a tick downward from uh, January. In January, he was at 51 approved. Uh, so he's come down um, four points in the uh, job approval there and was at 42 disapproved, now up to 47, so up five. So it's an interesting result that his job approval has shifted, but his vote has not shifted appreciably over that period, or to the extent it shifted at all, that one point went the other direction. We asked a pretty standard uh, question in most of our polls. Uh, do you think things are headed in the right direction? Or are we on the wrong track? We ask that question again here. So trying to get a simple gauge of the whole state without mentioning candidate names or trying to focus people on something in particular, 54% uh, say right direction, 42% say uh, it's off on the wrong track. Um, that's virtually unchanged from January when it was 54-40. Uh, so very little difference in uh, the right direction, wrong track. Again, the two-point uptick in wrong track is well within sampling error. So people on balance are a net positive about the direction of the state by whatever that is, 12 points, um, and fairly stable <coughs> compared to two months ago. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of recent developments. The, the governor signed his uh, tax cut proposal, more than $500 million. <coughs> Income and property uh, tax cuts. Uh, how do people in the state feel about that? Uh, people like tax cuts. That's, I'm sure, a surprise. 
so 55% say they favored the 500 million. We just rounded it off in property and income tax in the way we asked the question. Um, uh, it's worth noting that in uh, the fall, when uh, other tax cuts were passed, we found similar levels in the mid 50s favoring the tax cuts and opposition to them in the mid 30s. There is a fair amount of cynicism about tax cuts, though, isn't there? There is indeed. Mm -hmm. um, when we ask who the tax cuts do more for, do they do more for the poor, the middle class, or the wealthy, uh, it's striking what a large percentage say the wealthy benefit from tax cuts. Uh, it seems unlikely that 58% of the sample consider themselves to be wealthy and yet favor the tax cut that was done. So I think this is an interesting example of some mixed feelings about tax policy and about tax cuts. Um, and the fact that these attitudes don't always uh, get move in lockstep with each other. One can think that the distributional effects of tax cuts are weighted to people who are better off and yet still be pleased to get a tax cut of any kind. Job creation will obviously be a, a big issue in this year's uh, governor's race. Uh, how do people think we're doing, the state of Wisconsin, uh, opposed to our neighbors in other states? And if I could put this just a little bit in context, look at the direction of the state, which is pretty positive for the governor, and look at the tax cut bill, which is pretty positive for him. You'll see some others where his positions line up well with voters. But on the jobs issue, we're looking at something where he remains somewhat vulnerable. Um, so is Wisconsin creating jobs faster at the same rate or lagging behind other states? 45% uh, now say lagging, 37 say the same rate, and 12% say faster. And this has been moving a little bit, I think I had last times. Uh, so it was 40% lagging in January, uh, with a little bigger on the same and about the same on faster. What we've seen is a kind of a U-shaped curve in this. Back in May, when we first started asking this question, 49% said lagging behind. Then that fell a little bit in July. No, it actually didn't fall much in July. But it fell quite a bit in October and fell again in January to this low point of 40% lagging. Now we've seen that pick up about five points with more people saying lagging. Um, I said no events happened while we were in the field. The latest jobs numbers came out uh, the day before uh, we were in the field. So to the extent people were reading the papers or paying attention to that coverage, um, that news was out before we could serve. The, the governor's been asked repeatedly about uh, the promise he made as a candidate uh, back when he originally ran uh, for governor. He said uh, the state would create 250,000 jobs during his first term in office. Um, we asked people about whether they thought we would achieve that goal. Uh, how do people feel about that? Um, not very likely. Uh, this is essentially unchanged since January. People have not become any more optimistic about the jobs goal. And as you can see, overwhelmingly, four out of five say we're not going to reach that goal. Uh, as we talked about in January, the question is, will failure to reach that goal really matter for the fall of election? Will the governor be, at least in part, held responsible for the for the goal and, and achieving it or not? Or will he convince voters that uh, whatever shortfall there was was from forces outside of his control? Um, and how do voters feel about this? Well, so, so we well, yes. <laughs> um, How important would this issue be in determining your vote 29% very important, 44 somewhat, and a total of 26% in the not very or not at all category. So there's still quite a few folks that put at least some importance to this. Um, the obvious warning is there's a heavy degree of partisanship here that the governor's foes are much more apt to say, absolutely, this is very important, I'll hold him responsible for it. It's not clear that their votes are actually being moved by the issue, but they are certainly being reinforced by it. And likewise, the question of how much do people who support the governor 
come to fall into those bottom two categories, giving less and less weight to it. We didn't see very much change between January and now. It will be of interest to look in the fall as to whether this issue has changed the way it structures opinion or not. We also asked a, a favorable, unfavorable question about the Democratic candidate Mary Burke. How did she fare? Yeah, um, we moved into thinking about the candidates and their images. So the, the first version of that is, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view? 19% um, favorable, 22% unfavorable, uh, just three points net unfavorable, and 53 not heard, and I would urge you to add the six that say, well, I've heard of her, but I don't know enough to have a favorable or unfavorable view. So putting those two together, 59% who are unable to rate her on this favorability. Now, that, that's a large number, but it's down from where we were two months ago when it was 70% unable to rate her. Uh, and so here you see it in October, that poll was about two weeks after she entered the race. Uh, and you can see the 70% don't know. In January, it hadn't budged at all. Still 70% don't know. Um, Mike was saying earlier that that January data was before we had any advertising, uh, before the state, or just at the time of the state, of the state address, um, uh, you know, before the campaign has started to ramp up. Granted, it hasn't fully ramped up yet, but it's getting there. Um, and so you do see a little bit of movement. There's now about 11% more of the public who have developed an impression of Burke uh, after this, in this two-month interval. That includes the advertising that others have done, uh, criticizing her, uh, some ads that she has done, obviously, promoting herself. Um, it is of maybe minor interest to look that in the very first poll, she was a net three points favorable. In January, a net negative by six points. But in this latest data, that net negative has dropped from six points negative to just three points negative. So while you know this is hardly a deluge of everyone in the state coming to know who she is, that will take the rest of the summer before we reach that point. Just at the margin here, we're seeing a little more knowledge and net just slightly more favorable than it was to Jay. We look at still a net negative. No. We looked at the governor's job approval rating earlier. Now let's look at the favorable, unfavorable, because it's a slightly different question. You get a slightly different response. Right. Um, and so for him, everybody knows him. Only 5% not able to rate him. Uh, but here, a, a veritable tie, 49-47, just a little more uh, positive than negative. Um, this is the ballpark that he's fluctuated in. If we look back um, to January here on the right, it was 49 favorable, 44 unfavorable. And uh, earlier in October, it was 50 favorable and 46 unfavorable. So if you just look at the trend here, 50 to 49, 46 to 44, and then this latest one, the 44 is bouncing up to 47, the 49 is holding stable. Not a whole lot of trend here. Again, the changes are within the margin of error. But you see some indication of maybe a little bit of shift in people's opinions. In this poll, we asked uh, what some people call an empathy question or a compassion question. Charles will give us the precise language because uh, when you talk to people who have voted, oftentimes this is one of those factors that does make a difference to them when they go to the polls. Um, so the classic question here is, um, would you say um, the following phrase describes this candidate? So would you say the phrase cares about people like you describes Scott Walker? Does the phrase cares about people like you describe Tam uh, Tammy Baldwin? That was last election. Mary Burke. I beg your pardon? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so that's the, the, the basic question. Uh, I should add a little wee methodological point. We randomize the order in which you get the two questions, so half the sample 
here is Walker first, and then Burke. The other half, for example, here is Burke, and then Walker. Makes virtually no difference in any of the results, but it's a way of just verifying that the order of the questions uh, don't matter. Um, so here's the Walker uh, cares. So describes means the people say this phrase describes him, does not describe it, does not describe him. Um, and 43% say it does describe him, and 51 say it does not. Uh, so for uh, an incumbent governor, perhaps this was a little surprising that um, the empathy factor, if you will, is a little upside down for him and Mary Burke. And Mary Burke? It's the other way around, though, with an awful lot of people saying they don't know. 36% uh, says uh, cares about you, describes her. 29% does not. A net plus seven on this. Um, and they don't know still at a very large 34% that will have to move over time. Um, it's worth just noting that in 2012, in the Senate race, we did see some evolution of perception about this over the course of the year for Tommy Thompson, uh, though uh, for uh, now Senator Baldwin, uh, the trend barely moved at all over the course of the year. So we'll want to watch this. I think the shifting of it over the course of 2012 uh, for, for um, um, Thompson indicates just that this can be a malleable, can be a shift changeable perception. We talk about things that have happened since our last poll in January. Something else that has happened is it was the release of those uh, 27,000 pages of documents related to the first John Doe investigation that uh, resulted in charges against a number of the, the governor's former aides or associates when he was a county executive. Um, those documents came out. Uh, they got a lot of news coverage. Um, are people aware of the news coverage? Did they follow the story at all? Yeah. It, it, Let's just see what they say. Two-thirds, 67% said they had read or heard something about the emails. 31% uh, had not paid attention to that. Um, uh, that's, again, a relatively high percentage of awareness of any single news story. Uh, you often don't get over 50% awareness. Um, so this is, I think, in the ballpark of pretty significant awareness, though certainly not universal awareness. Does it make any difference in how they feel yeah. about the governor? So we followed it up. Now, it only made sense to ask this question of people who said they had heard something. So this is a question asked only of the 67% who had heard. But the, the question we asked was, did the emails give you a more favorable or less favorable impression of Walker? Or did they make no difference? And so no difference is the biggest group at 53%, just over a majority, but a very substantial 43% saying less favorable, and a, a very small 3% saying um, people came away with a more favorable impression. So large awareness and a very lopsided response to it, though the no difference category is the largest single category. A couple of things happening with voting in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the state's new photo ID law still tie up in court for the time being. It's possible that could come back to the legislature at some point. The governor says he'd like to see something uh, happen with that. Uh, let's begin there. We'll talk about early voting in a moment, but uh, let's talk about photo ID and whether people have strong feelings about photo ID in the state. Um, despite the court cases and a couple of years plus of debate about it, Opinion is still about where it was in May of 2012, with 60% in the spring of, of 2012. So whatever the discussion has been, whatever the cases, court cases have been, whatever the kinds of political arguments on both sides, have essentially left opinion on this issue completely unchanged from where it stood uh, almost two years ago. Let's talk about early voting. The legislature has uh, passed uh, measures that would, if you're a Democrat, restrict early voting. If you're a Republican, make early voting uniform. I want to make sure I'm reaching out to everyone here in the room to make sure I'm stating that accurately. Um, but it would be uh, a change in, in the way early voting has been done uh, in Wisconsin. You came at this question, I think, to try and give us a little uh, context. And, and so explain what you did and, and what we found. 
So we asked people um, how much early voting would they like to see, and we offered them four alternatives. The first was three weeks, including three weekends. That was the plan that was in place prior to 2011, was a, a rule that was adopted during the Doyle administration. The next option was two weeks, including one weekend. That was implemented in 2011 um, uh, with the governor's signature. Uh, the current bill, which has passed both houses of the legislature, but is awaiting the, the governor's decision to sign or veto it, is for two weeks with no weekend voting. And finally, we also obviously offered the last alternative, no early voting at all. It's good for you to walk down to the polls on Tuesday. Um, so you see the distribution here, 39%. And, and notice the way we asked the question. We didn't cue which party was on which side. We just asked what kind of early voting would you like. Um, a lot to none. Uh, so 39% would prefer the longer period, including the three weekends. 27% are satisfied with the system we have as of the moment. 12% uh, would, would favor the current proposal before the governor. And 20% would just undo it all together and, um, again, go back to just Tuesday voting. Um, and 2%. We're anxious to get back to the basketball game. <laughs> and the governor has not said what he's going to do with yeah. the legislation just yet. A um, couple of local control issues, Charles. Uh, first one uh, involves an issue that doesn't get a lot of attention in the block area, but it's a big issue outstate, and it's not the big mine that they're talking about in northwestern Wisconsin. It's sand mining. Uh, we have apparently sand that is really great for fracking. And, uh, and so a lot of these mines are opening around the state, and uh, it becomes something of a hot-button issue in some parts of Wisconsin, and we asked about it. And in particular, it goes to the issue of how much local communities, municipal governments, and cities should be able to regulate uh, elements of the sand mining industry. Um, and so the question we asked was, um, do you think local governments should be allowed to regulate sand mines? Or should that be something that only the state does? Uh, so 53% would allow the local control over um, sand mining, and 35% uh, think that should be a function of the state, and that the locality should not be able to, um, to intervene and impose their own regulations, with 12% undecided or don't know. We asked about the minimum wage, too, because as you know, here in Milwaukee County, there's been a fair amount of debate about whether some employees should have uh, what's been called a living wage, uh, just over $11 an hour. There were some efforts at the state level to try and stop that. Uh, what did we find in terms of whether people feel the state or local government should be making that determination? So with the same framing of the question on this one, the results reverse. Uh, a smaller number, 42%, would allow local control of um, uh, minimum wage, but 50%, 88 eight points higher, uh, think that should be reserved to the state. So at least to the extent that you look at these as state versus local autonomy, you see a, a small flip in the pattern between the two. It depends on what the issue is and perhaps how much partisan argument there's been about it. I think the visible partisan argument about uh, the minimum wage at the local level is perhaps a little more visible, at least in my year, uh, compared to the sand mining, which is a little less visible, I believe. Uh, states like Colorado and Washington have uh, made recreational marijuana legal. Uh, a Democratic state lawmaker from Madison, surprisingly, has introduced uh, legislation that would make marijuana legal in Wisconsin. And uh, uh, it's probably not going anywhere, but this is one of those issues that's starting to get a lot more attention nationally, so we thought we would ask about it. What did we find? Indeed it is. Um, so 42% said marijuana should be legal. 52% said it should be illegal. That reverses the findings that we had from our October poll. Uh, in October, we found 50% uh, favored legalization, 45% opposed. Uh, the caveat there is that in the October poll, we only asked this question of half the sample, 400 respondents instead of the full 800. Um, and so it has a bigger margin of error in the October data of five points. Still, I think you look at the comparison of those two, 
and either think that maybe it has shifted a bit or that um, attitudes are unstable enough on this issue is only coming to be a, a viable option in not just Wisconsin, but many states' policy agendas uh, recently, and again, at least to my year, is only beginning to be fully debated in the states, so people are probably still uh, shifting their opinions a bit about it. Yeah, we should say, for example, yesterday Mary Burke here uh, said she uh, supports the uh, legalization of medicinal marijuana, so there, you know, that, that is a discussion that's uh, beginning to emerge in the state. Uh, we asked a couple questions about same-sex marriage, as you know, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the state's, uh, uh, in essence, its ban on same-sex marriage uh, uh, is being challenged in court. Uh, Democrats would like to repeal uh, the constitutional amendment uh, that uh, currently bans it. Um, what do we find uh, as people's attitudes about this issue? Um, so 48% support marriage as an option, 24% civil union, 24% no legal recognition. Uh, that's a little shifted from uh, January when it was 53% supporting marriage, 24 civil unions, and 19 for no recognition. This is an issue where there has been a long-term trend. Uh, in Wisconsin data, you can see support for marriage rising over time. In national data, you can certainly see it very sharply rising, especially in the last four or five years. I don't think there's much question about uh, the direction of attitude change here. But I did want to give you a little sense of the variability in the answers we've had to it. We've asked about it uh, eight times since the fall of 2012 on various surveys. And in those questions, it's varied between 42 and 53 percent supporting marriage. Uh, varied between uh, 24 and 27 for civil unions and between 19 and 28 for uh, no recognition. So you can see there's a, a moderate range of variability there. As I say, a little bit of that is trend as well. Um, but the bottom line is this distribution has largely, at least in qualitative terms, been pretty much what we've seen over the last two years. Uh, of course, the, the state ban was the result of, of people going to the polls. They voted, I think close to 60-40 in favor of the ban, uh, passed through two consecutive sessions of the legislature. Uh, we asked an interesting question. Uh, Democrats say the ban should be repealed. We asked a question if there were a vote today. We'll try fine. And so 36% would continue the ban, 59% would vote to repeal the amendment. Uh, so that's if, uh, uh, again, I already gave the appropriate qualification of the difference between the poll and who's motivated to show up at the polls on election day. Uh, but the, the almost complete reversal of these numbers compared to where the vote was in 2006 is, I think, striking. So talk about the minimum wage, that's in the news a lot. Um, uh, do people uh, support a hike in the minimum wage? Do they oppose it? And, and, and I think it's important for you to tell us how we ask this question, because you can get Probably different responses depending on how you ask. This. Right. Um, so we ask a balanced form of the question, one that asks, do you support an increase in the minimum wage to benefit low-income workers? I'm sorry, I should say. The phrasing of the question is, some people say we should increase the minimum wage to benefit low-income workers. Others argue that increasing the minimum wage would uh, cause some businesses to cut jobs. So we offer both of those as part of the question, and then ask whether you support or oppose. So even with the, the warning that uh, some people believe jobs would be hurt, 63% uh, of support, 33% oppose. I also think it's interesting to look at that in light of the earlier question on local control of minimum wage. So you might view that as a difference over views of the minimum wage, you might also look at it the way I intended it when I wrote the question, at least, that we were looking at a local control issue over a particular policy versus state control. So people could differ on these for reasonable arguments between the two. Uh, but despite the uh, lack of support, relatively speaking, at least the small majority opposing local control of minimum wage, on the broader question, and even with the jobs issue being brought up, uh, 
there's a, a striking 30-point advantage um, for increasing minimum wage. I think six state Democrats would like to see this become a uh, an issue that's at the at the front of a lot of campaigns in the fall. Could we find out in our polling, Charles, whether or not this was a, a, an issue that would resonate with voters or make a difference in how they voted? Right. Um, so we went about it this way. Um, we didn't want to ask people first, would you go do this, and then would you do the opposite, because you've obviously primed them for the, the first alternative. So what we did was we split the sample in half. So for the first half of the sample, we said, uh, would you be more likely or less likely to vote for someone who supports raising the minimum wage, or would it make no difference? And then for the other half of the sample, exactly the same phrasing, but more likely or less likely to vote for someone who opposes raising the minimum wage. And so this way, neither gets primed with the other side of the question to just hit this question. So on supporters, 34% say they'd be more likely to support a candidate for office who favored increasing or supported raising the minimum wage. 16% uh, less likely, and half, 49%, wouldn't make any difference to them. When you flip it around and ask about a candidate who opposes raising the minimum wage, 21 are more likely to vote for an opponent, but 34% less likely to vote for an opponent of increasing minimum wage. So the gap between these two of uh, 34 to 16 more likely to less on supporters of a minimum wage increase and the reverse, 21, 34 for opponents, shows that there's potential here for this issue to, to carry some weight. As always, the rubber meets the road when it actually comes to choosing a candidate and hearing the debate about the campaign. But this is our effort to uh, tease out the effect of this issue. And we did the same thing with the Affordable Care Act, which obviously is something that Republicans want to want to talk a lot about in, in, in the fall campaign, about what they perceive as failures of the Affordable Care Act. How do people feel about it? And, and again, Charles, maybe you just walk us through whether or not that would influence sure. people's voting decisions. Um, so the first is simply, uh, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the um, uh, health care reform? Uh, 39 favorable, 50 unfavorable. Um, that's a little bit of a rise in favorability compared to last Oops, I don't have those numbers right in front of me. But it was a little less favorable in January, um, a little more unfavorable in January as well. On the other hand, it had been closer to each other in October, so before the rollout of the health care exchanges, there was more unfavorable than favorable as there has been in our and national polling since the law was passed. But there was a clear hit to that in January after all the problems. Here we're seeing a little bit of a rebound, but it's not a very big rebound, and as you can see, it's still a 39.50 um, unfavorable so, majority. So, so what do people want done? Well, that's the side issue is it's one thing to be unhappy about it, it's another to decide what to do. So we used a question that gave people four options. Keep it as it is, keep and uh, improve it by amendments, uh, repeal it and replace it with a new plan, or just repeal the whole thing and be done with it. We didn't say and be done with it just repeal the bill uh, and not replace it. Um, and so you see that despite people's unhappiness with the, the law and just 8% that would keep it the way it is, there's a, a striking more than half, 52%, that don't seem to be in the repeal and replace camp, but instead say keep the structure as it is, but amend it in ways to fix the problems with it. Um, with 18% in repeal and replace, and a similar 18% in just repeal it completely. So you see quite a difference between, I think, the unhappiness with the law as it currently exists, but that doesn't translate into uh, strong support for completely repealing something in these two middle categories. And let's be clear, some 
Yeah. Where is the dividing line between keeping and improving versus repealing and replacing? Those could start to look an awful lot like one another when you're talking about what amendments you would accept or change. None of that seems likely to happen in the real short term, though. And let's talk about the politics, or at least the potential politics of this. So here we ask the same question. There's been a lot of talk, especially looking ahead to the fall uh, congressional elections about whether support of health care is uh, really damaging. Um, there's been less talk about whether support for repealing it is damaging or not. So we did the same thing we did before for minimum wage. We asked half the sample, would you be more or less likely to vote for someone who supports health care reform? And, or it meant, meant, would it make no difference? And then for the other half, uh, would you be more or less likely to vote for someone who favors complete repeal of health care reform? Um, so what you find is a little bit uh, more or less likely to support a supporter of health care reform, uh, 28 to 25, a very modest difference, but more less likely to support 45, it doesn't matter. But what about repealers? Also less likely to support. Uh, um, I find this actually kind of in, in concert with previous slides. There's not a huge advantage, but maybe not a huge disadvantage to being a supporter of the law. There's a disadvantage, though not a gigantic one, for being a full repealer. It seems pretty clear in connection, with, in, in conjunction with the uh, what do you want, that people don't want either of these polar opposites. They're really looking for something in between, and uh, I, I think are not finding that very handy at this point. We've got about the three more uh, results we'll share with you, and then we'll take a, a, a couple of questions here. Charles, let's look at the President's job approval rating. The um, President's job is appro uh, approval has rebounded slightly to 47 approved, 49 disapproved, um, a little net negative. If you look at his trend in October, it was 49, 46. And then in January, again, after health care rollout, took a pretty big hit to 44.50, and now a little bit of a rebound to 47.49. Congressman Paul Ryan has been in the news a lot, so he's been talking about uh, poverty and what we should do about it. Um, we asked about Paul Ryan. Um, so 39 favorable, 35 unfavorable, a um, um, little bit net positive. And uh, as with a lot of congressmen, even ones who were on the vice presidential line on the ballot uh, just two years ago, 25% uh, of the state who think they don't know enough about it to have an opinion. Um, uh, just to give you a little context on that, the month before he was picked for the vice presidency, 35% didn't know who he was. Uh, that went down to under 10% as we got to election day. But how quickly we forget, I suppose. <laughs> well, he somehow feels badly that 21% haven't heard of him. He's, he's doing much better than Senator Johnson is. Senator yeah, Johnson, though, 40%, 34 is the idea that don't know. So that's a pretty striking figure uh, at the, really, almost exactly, the halfway mark of his first term. I just would say, he's not been invisible either. I mean, actually, you see him on television a lot. He's, in a, he's writing op-eds. I, I mean, he's... But it is interesting. And, it's, it, and you might think Senator Johnson would promote really strong feelings. Among partisans, I think that's undoubtedly the case. Uh, loving or hating partisans who are really focused on him have strong reactions to him. But it's very clear here that that doesn't apply to the, to the bulk of the state with 44% uh, not really having formed an opinion. We all live in the political bubble, Charles. I think everything I know is just riveted by these things. And by the fact that you're here, you by definition, <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> part of that bubble. Tammy Baldwin, Senator Baldwin. The junior senator is a little better known. 30% uh, don't know her compared to 44%. So what you see here, again, is uh, maybe a little head shaking. Uh, but it's not unusual in the big extreme, the big picture of things that outside of election periods, a lot of folks who are marginally attached to politics, marginally interested in politics, um, carry around really strong, really well-developed opinions of uh, members of Congress in particular. And I think this set of three 
shows you something of the range there that uh, uh, shows that at every election cycle, this will certainly happen for Senator Johnson if he runs for re-election, a period of time in 2015 or early 2016 where he will go through building name recognition, maybe from a slightly lower level, but not too different from what Mary Burke is doing now in going from 70 to 59, just to put that in perspective too, and working her way down. Uh, nobody's coming close to Governor Walker's uh, 5 percent, though. We, we always encourage people to go to our website, law.marquette.edu, uh, look at the poll for yourself. Uh, we're as transparent as possible, and uh, we appreciate your feedback on, on what you see. Uh, having said that, let's take some questions from the audience. Please raise your hand. We'll get to as many of them as possible. Yes, sir. It seems to me that uh, as time passes, more and more people with telephones have caller ID. Yes. And those same people more and more frequently are declining to answer the phone if they don't recognize the, the caller who's calling them. Uh, it seems to me that that ought to harm the randomness of telephone calling overall. And is there anything you guys can do about it? I would have to go door to door. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in the good old days, we did go door to door. If, uh, we go back to the George Gallup days in the 30s. That was, uh, was what was done. Um, it is a huge issue in the polling industry. Um, when I was a grad student in 1980, I worked on a project that had a 76% uh, response rate on telephone survey. Our response rate is under 10%, it's about 7%. Now that sounds horrible, and it is horrible, but we're right at the industry average. That's where response rates have fallen to in part because since those dark days when I was in grad school to now, the rise of telemarketing that makes you not want to pick up your telephone, um, uh, caller ID, um, message machines, and so on, all of those things have really affected the response rate. So on the face of it, you would say, well, <laughs> why are we even, even bothering with this? And the answer ultimately is, well, twofold. One is, there are a lot of studies that call a number, they don't get an answer, they'll then call it back a week later or a month later. And sometimes you get people to pick it up the second time or the third time, right? Um, now part of that is just people not being home and you catch them. But what the research has shown is that a lot of people um, make spur of the moment decisions about whether to pick up that phone or not. Uh, I, I, I'm not dismissing because I, I do it too. Uh, I shouldn't tell you that, should I? Um, but it's not a, always a permanent fixed behavior that we have. The second part though, and it's really critical for what we do, is it's not correlated with partisanship. It's not that you ask yourself, how do I feel about Governor Walker today? and then decide whether to pick up the phone or not. It's not that Republicans are uniformly more likely to cooperate on the phone and Democrats less likely. And so, the, in the end, the proof is in the accuracy of the polling. And that's one of the areas where political polling is a real benchmark for the polling industry as a whole. If I ask you, do you like Tide or Cheer better? It's really hard to know whether my answers are right or not. But if I ask if you're going to vote for Romney or vote for Obama, I get to find out in November whether that was right or not. So the really counterintuitive result is that despite this steep decline in response rates, which is industry-wide, the forecasting accuracy, the accuracy of the polls in predicting the outcomes of presidential, senate, and governor's races has remained basically flat for the last 35 years and in the time since 2010, really puzzling, has actually improved slightly. So we're no better or no worse off than we were 30, 35 years ago uh, and on average we're quite accurate. But that doesn't mean individual polls can't uh, you know, be better or worse. So, so that's the only comforting story about response rates 
is that it don't seem to have affected the accuracy for election forecasting. And uh, um, that's because the decision to answer or not is not really related to the partisanship. Relative to your series of health care mm -hmm. reform questions, any idea as to how many of the respondents are actually impacted by the reforms? Right. And how many feel that we're just stuck with it no matter what? Right. Um, we may revisit this at some point. I have not asked about it, and the reason is we're doing a sample of registered voters, not a sample of the adult population. Registered voters are more educated, better income, more likely to participate in a wide variety of civic programs and affairs. And so I felt like asking a question about did you go on an exchange? Did you know what were your personal experiences with the health care reform? Would have the unfortunate impact of leaving out a pretty big percentage of people who are affected by it because they're not registered to vote. So for that reason, we've not gone directly to that. I think there are other polls out there. Um, the Kaiser Family Fund supports a really detailed polling. I'm sure there's some census data that will be coming down the road about this that I think is much more valid as an assessment of what happens to people. Um, so I think it's fine to ask about people's attitudes towards it the way we do and how that affects their vote or their perceptions of other people. I just don't think our sampling of registered voters makes that a very good instrument for trying to assess personal experience. Uh, first, a, a, a comment, and it's, it's what I'm sure everyone in this room shares, which is gratitude for what you both are doing and presenting uh, this information uh, to us. Uh, two questions. Um, do you think it might make sense in terms of really holding accuracy if uh, the polling were limited to likely to vote, not mm -hmm. really registered? Right. right. And also a second question, it's sort of a follow-up to the uh, first question. Um, are we driven as voters by what we are hearing as poll results? Is sure. there research or yeah. Yeah. what are your impressions? As, as great questions. Um, um, likely voters are a really important question, but the answer seems, based on the evidence, to go the opposite direction this far away from an election. And by the way, if you go to the cross tabs that we post online, you actually can look at the likely voters. The reason I don't report it at this early stage is there's been a lot of research showing that until you get to August or even September, there's more variation in people saying whether they'll vote or not or how likely they are to vote than there is in their actual vote choice. And so as a result, if you're having people who are unused the turnout randomness with the vote preference, okay? So by the time we reach August or certainly the 1st of September, we will start putting out as part of the basic release the, the results for both likely voters and registered voters because it's very interesting to see the difference between the two. But the reason we don't do it, or at least don't promote it at this point, is because that research makes me think likely voters are not a very reliable indicator this early on. Okay? Um, and I knew I would forget the second question. Oh! Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Here's, here's the interesting thing. Um, if you thought that the lopsided polls would systematically drive votes. You'd expect to see much bigger er errors in a, in a state with lopsided polling versus close polling. You don't see very much difference between those two. Um, there's also some experiments from earlier times, so they've sometimes been replicated, where in the course of the survey, the voter is given information about recent polling in the election, and then so half are given that information, half are not, and then you can see if their vote changes. And the good news for me 
as a as both pollster and as someone who's not interested in changing your vote, I just want to measure it, is that those experiments show very modest effects of people being changed by what they are told earlier in the survey about um, other polls. So uh, I think the encouraging news is not that much of an effect, and it has been studied a fair bit. Thanks for the questions. I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. It's 1.15. Um, we appreciate you uh, joining us again for the release of the poll. We'll be polling throughout the rest of the year, probably a bit more frequency as we get closer to the election. Um, our next uh, major event here at the law school is April 1st. It's uh, next week. And we'll be looking at uh, uh, Milwaukee's uh, education outlook. <coughs> as you know, the superintendent is leaving and a lot of discussion about what we should be doing, what's working elsewhere, and we'll spend uh, the better part of the morning talking about that on April 1st. You're all welcome to attend. The next on the Issues event is on the 10th of April, and it will be Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark. A busy schedule. I invite you again to check out the website. Thanks so much for your time, your attention, and we'll see you next time on the Issues event.